Um, I think we've had a lot of panels today where the underlying substance of the issue is so interesting <laughs> that we all go fight about that, uh, such as the right to be forgotten and whether there should be one. This is another panel where I think that temptation will be great, and it's, it's somewhat unavoidable, the sort of the, the questions about um, the power of private actors to accomplish things that historically maybe were primarily done by states. Um, that's, that is a meaty, meaty question, and it has many angles besides the, the jurisdictional ones. But we're gonna, we're gonna try to focus on how this plays out in the context of a world with differing laws, differing values, differing approaches to speech. Um, I'm gonna introduce the panelists briefly, remind them to please have questions for each other at the end, and I'll do some timekeeping down there with the reasonably polite signs um, that we made. So we are, I'm gonna start with uh, Emma, who's going to speak first. Emma Lanso is the director of the Free Expression Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology. She's a really important thinker in this area. Uh, she was involved in the DART v. Backpage case, which set important precedent about when and how governments can sort of nudge private actors to do things that are not in fact required by, by law and that constrain speech. Uh, we also have Peter Stern, policy manager for product policy at Facebook. He is at ground zero for all of these things. I will implore people to be nice to him. I mean, ask intellectually searching questions, but to don't be mean. Um, we have Min Jang, who is Associate Professor of Communication at UNC Charlotte. She is also a Secretariat member at the Chinese Internet Research Conference. Um, and her work there is important not only with respect to China, but as a case study for what countries can do with technology, with law. Uh, we also have Anupam Chander from UC Davis. Um, Mark Lemley and I teach an intermediary liability class where we use your article about how law made Silicon Valley. Copyright style, <laughs> <laughs> We're giving you credit. <laughs> we, we tell them you wrote it. <laughs> um, and that's all I want. Uh, so he, he's going to make some, some remarks today that, that I think relate to that and, and um, touch on the jurisdiction issues here. And finally, Juniper Downs, Global Head of Policy at YouTube, which means that she sees content the rest of us don't even want to think about and preserves grace and wit and thoughtfulness and concern for human rights in trying to decide what to do with that. So um, we'll start with Emma and take it away. Thank you. Um, so. This panel, we're talking about uh, kind of the intersections between companies' terms of service and uh, national law and, and government action. And I thought I might tee up some of the issues that that intersection can really um, bring out by talking about uh, one kind of program that we've seen develop over the past couple of years, um, particularly in Europe, which is the creation of these things known as internet referral units. Um, these are coming up in the context of uh, counterterrorism efforts, uh, efforts by governments to pursue terrorist propaganda online, or you know, defined more broadly than terrorist propaganda, so-called extremist content. Um, one of the big questions under these kinds of programs is what exactly is the content, is the speech that governments are trying to pursue? Um, but the mechanism that they use to pursue this content under these internet referral unit programs um, is, in fact, companies' terms of service. Uh, so you have under these programs um, issues where, for the, to take the UK example, um, the, U, the Metropolitan Police in the United Kingdom will identify content that they uh, believe violates the law and also violates the company's terms of service. And then rather than taking that law through a full formal prosecution in the courts of the United Kingdom to get an independent arbiter to declare, yes, this video or this post violates our uh, counterterrorism act or our laws against hate speech, uh, they instead flag that content to one of the internet companies who's hosting it um, for the company to then review under their own terms of service. Uh, this is, a, I think, a, a pretty concerning development. A program in the UK started in 2010, um, and in July 2015, Europol created a program that was uh, to be sort of coordinating these sorts of removal processes um, across Europe. And I think this kind of program raises a couple of really important issues for us to think about. Um, in As the EU counterterrorism coordinator was recommending that Europol set up this kind of program, he was sure to uh, kind of 
flag for everybody that um, this would allow law enforcement to refer material that breaches a platform's terms of conditions and not necessarily national law. Because of course, companies can and do and you know, in many cases are, are, are perfectly right to have terms that are more restrictive than what any particular government can restrict under the law. Um, but that means that if law enforcement is pursuing removal of content, not according to the law in their country, but simply according to what a company has said is off limits for their particular platform, we have governments targeting speech that may not actually violate the law. Uh, we also have law enforcement ref uh, pursuing removal of content without the kind of independent assessment by a court or independent arbiter that that speech actually does violate the laws of the country. Um, and you know, we've talked a little bit today about issues of scale uh, and the idea that there is just so much of this unlawful content, um, whether it's violating hate speech laws in um, Germany or you know, is terrorist propaganda that's against the law in France. Uh, so there's sort of this pushback of the idea that the judiciary could even deal with all of this unlawful content. Um, kind of my, my first response to that, that concern is that, well, we don't want frank, uh, censorship to be frictionless, right? The, the point of all of our substantive and procedural protections for speech really is to ensure that it is not easy for a government to go after speech in a particularly a one-sided process that gives the speaker no opportunity to kind of defend the lawfulness, the appropriateness of their speech. Um, but even if we grant that scale is a problem uh, and that there is so much of this speech that is in violation of some nation's law and should be pursued um, and that the company's kind of content moderation systems are the most efficient way to pursue that, that's not where the question of scale ends. We also need to be much more creative than we have been in thinking about how to do oversight at scale. I think company transparency reporting is a, a big part of this, but it's also an obligation on the side of governments to be transparent about what it is that they're doing. Uh, and I also think we need to do a lot more for remedy at scale. Um, because we know even in the you know, best efforts of companies to enforce their terms of service, there will be mistakes made. There will be speech that is taken down, whether at government behest or not, um, that does not violate a company's terms. And uh, at this point, kind of in these systems that are mixing government and company action, um, the, uh, the result tends to be remedy is not available either from government or from companies to the speakers who are affected, um, rather than you know an easy access to remedy for the potentially great numbers of people whose um, speech is being silenced. And then uh, just to, to close, because I got the one minute warning probably 45 seconds ago, <laughs> um, earlier uh, today, David Drummond mentioned at the geo-blocking panel that geo-blocking of content in response to you know governments, uh, lawful orders from governments, is what you do to avoid global removal. Uh, but of course, terms of service enforcement tends to have a global impact across a platform. And I think what we are seeing is that governments are getting wise to this, right? Many governments like would like to see global effect of whatever their national law is, whether it's the Keneal in the Right to be Forgotten case or Pakistan uh, in the Innocence of Muslims case. There is a, a real interest in governments in having their their assessment of what content should come down affect the, the world around us. So I think um, we should be paying very close attention to this kind of government level leveraging of terms of service enforcement because that is the global removals mechanism that exists in the world for, for governments to try to use. Thanks very much. My name again is Peter Stern. I'm um, a lawyer by training but joined Facebook about two years ago. And I'm on the team now um, that we call our product policy team that makes the rules for what people can share on Facebook uh, and how we interact with developers and advertisers in that area. Um, so I thought that the way that the panel was framed in terms of questions about the interplay between terms of service and national law was really useful. And I want to try to use that as a jumping off point and give you Facebook's perspective on the way those things uh, work together and how we think about problems on a day-to-day -day basis. For us, it really starts with our mission of giving people the power to share and allowing them to connect with each other out in the world. And the tools that we've created, the space that we've created, really seek to accomplish that goal on a fundamental level. 
that's the freedom of expression side that probably everybody can see most readily and is most familiar with. At the same time, however, we know from a lot of experience that if people feel that there won't be a safe space for them on Facebook, they won't come and they won't share, and that will affect how they interact with the site, and that will be uh, very much a net negative for freedom of expression. So our community standards represent our attempt to try and strike a balance, um, creating a broad space for people to share, but also creating a safe and welcoming environment so they won't stay away. And those are two important respects. Um, freedom of expression is something we seek to maximize through our community standards. Um, because they operate on a global level, the community standards aren't pegged to the law of any particular nation. They're grounded in human rights law. We engage with GNI and the Freedom Online Coalition, and um, uh, you know that they're informed by those principles, but they aren't pegged to any particular um, any particular law. Um, thanks. Um, and so this means that, as I think people are familiar with, we have to make really tough calls on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, I won't go into those in detail, but often they revolve around the idea of personal attacks. For example, it's okay to say death to America on Facebook. It's not okay to say death to Americans. And that's uh, a very important distinction for us because we want to create space for political dialogue, but we don't want people, people to feel that they're personally attacked. That's the type of distinction that we're trying to draw as we go about our, our rulemaking process. And so, unfortunately, I wasn't here for the very first panel today, but uh, what I gather was the comment about how important it is to try and balance the views of users, even leaving aside governments. I, I very much agree with that, and that's a big challenge for us. But in the formation of our community standards, where we try to do as much listening to all sorts of thought leaders and, and ordinary users as possible, we try to bake that into the process at that stage. So the community standards represent stuff that we think belongs on the platform, and fundamentally we want it to be on the platform because people put it there and we want to allow them to have that freedom of expression. But it does happen sometimes that we will encounter a government that invokes local law um, to uh, try to get us to take something down. In those cases, the first question is, does it violate our community standards? If it does, then that's the end of the story. If it doesn't, then we go through a process of determining um, you know, how we can be respectful and mindful of local law, um, which is uh, a series of steps that we undertake, uh, looking at the uh, authority, the issuing authority, the nature of the request, um, whether it satisfies due process, whether it's directed at the creator of the content. And we really are very rigorous in this and push back um, and I try to be as um, you know, noisy about this process as we can, if you will. Um, but at the end of the day, if it meets our test, then we will make it unavailable in the country where the law um, was invoked. Um, so that's, that's the way we fundamentally approach this. That's our process. Um, and then the other big piece of the, of the equation for us is transparency. Um, and uh, we, we very much hear um, the importance of transparency. Um, that's one of the fundamental points I take away from Emma's remarks um, and, and other similar types of dialogue that we've had uh, around the way the governments, for example, use our uh, terms of service. And just to, you know, we, we welcome anybody to report content that doesn't uh, comply with our community standards. Fundamentally, we don't want that stuff on our platform. And so we're open to that and we act on it on that basis. Um, if it complies with the terms of standards, then we look at it under the, a, a more of a legal perspective, and that's a different lens. And, and we're very transparent about that as well, as people can see um, by looking at our transparency report, where we um, lay out the numbers um, and provide um, answers to questions and as much detail as we can. And I think it's fair to say that we're moving in the direction of ever more transparency in that report and in other forums. Uh, and that's something that I think we'll continue and is really important to us. So that's a broad overview. Thanks. Hi, my name is Mindy.
Jen. Um, I hail from the academic field of uh, communication, so I found the uh, legal discussions here really, really interesting. Uh, I research and write about uh, Chinese internet politics and policies. In my remarks, I will focus on the Chinese government's approach towards the internet, which has been framed by many as uh, internet sovereignty, and discuss its implications uh, for continent removal in this context. So what is uh, internet sovereignty as defined by the Chinese government? Some of you might remember that in 2010, after Google decided to leave China, the uh, Chinese government quickly issued a white paper stating that within Chinese territory, the internet is under the jurisdiction of Chinese sovereignty. It goes on to say that individuals and entities have the right and freedom to use the internet in China, but at the same time, uh, there is always the but uh, part, they must obey uh, the laws and regulations of China. So here the notion of internet sovereignty runs uh, very much counter to the very idea of border trespassing that professors Johnson and Post talk about in their 1996 article. However, despite many challenges, uh, the Chinese state seems to have been rather successful uh, to have done the impossible, right? Um, ramping up um, internet development in China very quickly while maintaining uh, social stability and uh, minimizing um, political consequences. In the past 20 years, uh, Chinese internet population grew from almost zero in 1996 to today's 700 million. And a handful of Chinese internet companies, uh, including Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, have been rather successful and also going and expanding overseas. So it looks like Beijing is really um, having the cake and eating it too, right? And one has to wonder, have we gotten the narrative about the internet wrong all along? Is it possible perhaps the internet is not so decentralized beyond anyone's control, but rather it's a sprawling network with certain choke points that make at least partial control possible. Perhaps the borders have not disappeared entirely, but just have been you know, morphed and reenacted um, in, through various means, including uh, by technology such as geolocation and through laws and regulations that are still very much based upon the idea of nation state. So in fact, the Chinese government never saw any contradiction at all between developing information technology and controlling it at the same time. In this 1984 photo, former Chinese President Deng Xiaoping was shown visiting kids, working and playing with computers, where he famously said, computer education must start with kids. Promoting the very idea that information technology was really critical to China's future. Further, in 19, 1995, on the cusp of China's adoption of the internet, the then Minister of Posts and Telecommunications, Wu Jichuan, uh, remarked that by linking with the internet, we do not mean absolute freedom of information. If you go through customs, you, you know, rationalizes this, you have to show your passport. This is the same with the management of information. So as you can tell from the very beginning, the Chinese government had a very different view about what the internet means and how um, they probably didn't figure out quickly how to control it, but the goal is to uh, make sure that information technology, however it's developed, will not contradict the notion of national sovereignty. So guided by such a vision, the Chinese government has painstakingly uh, grafted borders onto the internet in order to stop unwanted ideas. Uh, I'll skip the well-known you know, great firewall and human sensors and focus on three specific features pertaining to internet um, companies' content removal policies and practices. First is the idea of hybrid control. Um, unlike the regulation of TV, you know, radio before, uh, control of internet in China and many other authoritarian countries around the world is hybrid, hybrid, meaning that it's both decentralized and centralized at the same time. 
What do I mean by that? For instance, state agencies can issue um, directives directly to internet companies asking them to remove content, right? On the other hand, inter internet companies oftentimes, in order to keep or obtain their um, operating licenses, they will do whatever they could <laughs> to actually come up with their own rules about how to remove content, right? And so uh, this leads to the problem of sometimes over-censoring um, content uh, themselves. Second is the problem of um, bureaucratic fragmentation. This chart comes from a project I'm doing uh, looking at China's national level internet policies um, in the past 20 years. And it shows the state agencies at the national level involved in regulation. I, I must apologize, it's in Chinese, um, but I know my Chinese. <laughs> and, um, but what's, I think, uh, that's, I'm sorry, but that's the only way I can fit everything into one chart. <laughs> uh, well, this speaks definitely to the problem of having really too many cooks in the kitchen, for sure. Um, I must point out that in the past two to three years, there are really clear signs of um, power consolidation when it comes to internet regulation in the Chinese context. The third issue is the issue of um, arbitrariness. In the same project I'm doing, um, so this chart actually came, uh, came from the same project. It shows the vast majority of China's state internet uh, regulations are lower level rules concentrated at the very bottom of the pyramid, as you can tell. And owning a little over 10% are actual laws, um, judicial interpretations, and administrative regulations. So what it means is lower level rules, ironically, um, are sometimes and oftentimes more important compared to higher level laws, um, leading to some Chinese scholars to lament that in China, the constitution of China is inferior to common law. Common law is inferior to bureaucratic rules, and bureaucratic rules is inferior, are inferior to a leader's opinion. So in summary, I see the emergence of a new kind of internet world, where the internet is becoming renationalized. Orders are erected, cybersecurity is front and center. Second, the new internet world um, as such is no longer dominated by liberal democratic values. In fact, Freedom House's uh, data from 2012, uh, 2015, sorry, last year, shows that internet users living in countries labeled as not free and partly free exceed those living in countries labeled as internet free. Free as in freedom, not freebie. Um, third, even in traditional democracies, there are, to me, signs of um, that civil liberties are, have been eroded in some regard. One can think of examples such as NSA, Snowden Fair, the demise of Gawker recently, and the rise of Donald Trump. Last but not the least, global surveillance and filtering by states and very powerful um, internet giants are becoming the norm, which is really a problem. So as you might have noticed, my take on the state affairs of the internet is a little on the darker side, um, but this is you know, certainly not to deny There's, there are so many interesting inno innovations and you know, um, interesting identity and community formations around the world, around us every day. But in my mind, these are important issues um, and they're of a different kind that need also to be seriously uh, considered. I'll leave you with this two trillion dollar photo taken last year at US-China Internet Industry Forum that I believe sums up the zeitgeist and some many of the challenges that we face today. Uh, thank you, I look forward to our discussion later. Yeah. delight for me to be here to honor Johnson and Post for their um, the Law Review article that set sail a thousand Law Review articles, <laughs> the Helen of Troy of, uh, of Law Reviews. Um, so um, let me find my presentation here. Okay, so uh, my talk is um, about the justiciability of community guidelines 
Um, the question is whether or not we should um, allow for judicial enforcement of community guidelines through the civil system. Um, so in December 2015, um, Facebook employees, a few of them, were qu quite um, uh, worried. Um, there was this uh, information that was being distributed on the Facebook platform, uh, now by a leading presidential candidate. And the question was, was the information that he was posting hate speech uh, in violation of their community guidelines? Um, and this is the particular post that was at issue, um, and the details are not in this uh, particular uh, slide. Um, but the question was um, that there were users that were flagging this, uh, and so Facebook was now trying to decide what to do. Internally, um, they decided that uh, we are uh, not going to take this down, uh, and uh, Facebook would ultimately explain, essentially kind of indirectly explain the decision by saying, we're going to begin allowing items that are newsworthy, even if they might violate our community guidelines. They didn't say that this violated the community guidelines. They didn't indicate that this was connected to this particular case. And according to the Wall Street Journal's uh, sources, the decision to allow Mr. Trump's posts went all the way to Facebook uh, Inc.'s chief executive, to Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, thus the title of this talk, Should Mark Decide? Um, and he, of course, decided not to censor this material. If he had, uh, you can imagine the conflagration that would have resulted uh, in our political discourse. And it would have actually probably helped uh, this particular candidate uh, do uh, more of this speaking, in fact. Um, so, so the question is um, that this leaves, then, uh, Zuckerberg as potentially the world's most powerful editor, uh, as so named by uh, uh, an editor-in-chief of the largest Norwegian newspaper. Um, and so, the, uh, so, and this isn't, of course, just a question uh, that uh, is uh, peculiar to Facebook, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm focusing on, on, on that case uh, as a start. As the, and this is a question that is of, of interest uh, generally to uh, all kinds of platforms. Um, by the way, it's now uh, a quarter of humanity uh, that is at issue. This is a question that uh, affects uh, uh, YouTube, uh, and my pan my co-panelists can uh, describe those kinds of issues than they have so superbly already. Um, and of course, it leads to this uh, directly to the legal question of Section 230. Section 230 is a response, in some sense, to a perverse incentive that the law had created uh, in two prior cases. In Cubby, the CompuServe, the hosts of a bulletin board, an electronic bulletin board, were, were not held liable, um, whereas it, Prodigy was, a few years later, held liable. Why? The signal difference was that Prodigy said, we censor, we edit content, uh, we enforce community guidelines. So the fact that, uh, that Prodigy actually had community guidelines that it sought to enforce meant that it was held liable for, in that case, what was seen as a failure to enforce those community guidelines. Uh, this would, of course, lead to the perverse incentive of then jettisoning all community guidelines so that you wouldn't, therefore, be held liable for this kind of activity. Um, and so we've seen a variety of cases, and I just uh, pulled out a few here, uh, where uh, Section 230 was used to immunize both takedowns and refusals to take down. Um, I think the right term should be leave ups. Um, you know, so um, I, I don't know if there's a good term for that, but we need something uh, to refer to that particularly important move as well. Um, and so this is the case in the United States, but we've seen across the world um, in countries that don't have 230 um, or something as powerful as that, uh, efforts by governments to force takedowns. Sometimes this is done under local law, often it's done under local law, but it's often done because of some view of the interpretation of the community guidelines. Um, and uh, so we've seen this in a variety of images. Um, here is one involving um, an indigenous community in Brazil. 
Um, here is another in, uh, in, uh, in France involving, uh, again, an uh, 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 image from a, quite a while back. Um, interestingly, in this, by the way, just as an asterisk, the, the Musée Orsay itself says that the, this image uh, now openly displayed has taken its proper place in the history of modern painting, but it still raises the troubling question of uh, voyeurism. Okay, um, so just to uh, very quickly conclude in one minute or less, um, so imagine uh, the kind of uh, overlaps that we might see between permissible speech that is permissible because under community guidelines of Facebook or under the law. Uh, so the left column might be a very uh, permissive law, the middle column would be a very restrictive law, and the right uh, uh, Venn diagram would be kind of the more usual circumstance where each is somewhat more permissive or less permissive than the other uh, in, different, in different situations. The worry is that if we make uh, the Facebook rules or the platform rules justiciable, enforceable in court, uh, you're going to push uh, the law to, to enforce a particular, uh, to, to delegitimize legal speech, lawful speech. So the left side of the rightmost column, the left arc, would then be a basis upon which um, the, the country could actually stop perfectly legitimate speech. And this would be especially problematic because the fact that uh, civil sanctions are likely to include not just orders to take something down, an injunction, but also a civil penalty, which will then change the incentives for platforms to operate, uh, leading them to almost inevitably prefer to take things down rather than to leave them up. Uh, so I'll conclude with that. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Seemed like people wanted to clap. <laughs> we want to clap. <laughs> um, First, thanks, Daphne, for bringing us all together and putting the conference together. And, and thanks to all of you for staying till the bitter end. I know it's been a lot to digest um, all day today. So I want to start by saying that requests to remove content from our services are some of the toughest decisions we make at Google. And I want to start by explaining why. And this is going to um, be broad and then I'm going to get really narrow in terms of describing some of the actual processes that we use to make these decisions. So if you think of Google's mission, which really hasn't changed since our founding, which is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, um, there, there's obviously some, some biases, some principles, some values built into that mission. One is that openness is better than, than a closed system that there is, there is a value to, um, to breaking down barriers when it comes to the accessibility of information, and that information itself can be a very useful and powerful force in the world. Now at YouTube, which is of course part of Google, we just went through a process over the past couple of months to really um, drill down on what are the guiding values, what are the guiding principles that make YouTube what it is. And this was a process that in, involved Susan Wojcicki, our CEO, um, and many other leaders. And we arrived at four essential freedoms. Freedom of expression, freedom of information, the freedom to belong, and freedom of opportunity. And we took those and we decided YouTube's mission now is really to give everyone a voice and a chance to succeed, bring people together, and show them the world. And maybe the one that's kind of least intuitive there is the freedom to belong. And what that really means for us is as a new kind of media company, one of the things that we really value that we're proactively investing in is the diversity of voices on our platform. That unlike some, some traditional media companies, we have um, incredible creators from throughout the world and we're hosting events now. We did a black creator event in, in LA to bring together um, a con this community of creators who many of whom didn't know each other and to really start in doing proactive ecosystem work. We're doing work with women, we're doing work with Muslim creators and so on. So we really want YouTube to be, to be a platform where any Anyone can um, see their identity reflected and, and have that freedom to belong. Now, these, these questions about what we would remove from our services um, really stem from the fact that whatever's happening in the world is going to be reflected on, on Google, on YouTube, on many of the services we maintain. And so we take a dual approach. 
um, to these issues. And I want to be really clear that we handle our policy removals and our legal removals separately. So in terms of policy removals, um, most of our products have content policies or community guidelines that set the rules of the road for what we don't allow on, on the particular service. And they actually differ across Google based on the product. And that's because these policies are a reflection of the type of product and service that we're providing to our users. So if you think of search or maps, search aims to um, create a comprehensive map of the web, maps a comprehensive map of the world. And so um, being complete has a very high value. And so those products have um, very limited content policies. Um, there are very few instances where we'll remove content as a policy matter. Of course, we get requests to remove content that may violate a particular nation's law, and as discussed earlier on, on David Drummond's panel, we have the ability to geoblock, to restrict that content for the relevant jurisdiction. But if you take a product like YouTube, which is actually a destination site, a community where we are recommending additional content, where we're trying to maintain a certain environment, we do have um, broader policies for what we won't allow on the service. These cover things like hate speech and violence and so on. Now I want to, I want to um, explain that although we have policies that cover some of those things, there's a lot of nuance in, in how we actually evaluate content once it's flagged. And, and to be clear, this is all on a notice and takedown um, um, framework, of course. So once content is flagged, um, we, we have a, a saying internally that context is king. Um, and so even for something like violence, where um, obviously we see a lot of, of violent content uploaded from conflict zones around the world, um, we have an, an internal acronym called EDSA, which is Educational, Documentary, Scientific, and Artistic. And if the intent of the upload is to document, is to educate, if there's content um, you know, that's uploaded in a, in a scientific or artistic context, we generally allow it even if otherwise <coughs> it wouldn't, wouldn't be permissible on the platform. So there's a lot of nuance in, in how we've developed guidelines to set the rules of the road. Now we also have a legal removals process where on top of the policies, obviously there's content that may violate a particular nation's law, and we have a separate process, a legal removals form, that governments can submit that requires them to tell us the underlying law, where it violates, and so on. And um, there is a, a lot of, um, of nuance in that process as well, including when we would require a court order to do a removal, when notice is a sufficient mechanism. For example, many European laws were actually liable once we're on notice of the content, whether or not we have a court order. And all of these government removal requests are reflected on, in our transparency report. Now, I'll just end by saying, um, I think we are at a real inflection point on whether this system of self-regulation that I just described will continue to govern services like ours. And when I'm out there talking with governments, um, the, the question that I get most frequently is, does community policing really work? Um, isn't there another way to remove illegal content or content that violates your policies? Um, and so for, for everyone in this room um, who may have questions about the existing framework, I also welcome you to think about um, you know, what it might look like two, three, four, five years down the road um, if, if uh, we don't successfully kind of shape the public debate around what would happen if self-regulation were not the mechanism that platforms like ours are allowed to use to enforce these issues. Thank you to all of the panelists. Um, we, we're only running 10 minutes late, but I, I know that people are tired. So I, I think um, I will, I asked all of you to sort of have questions for each other, but I'll maybe shorten that and say, if you have something you really want to ask each other, as opposed to complying with my request, <laughs> um, uh, but please, please say so. Um, who, who has questions for each other? And you can think about it while I ask you a question, if you would like. And, and audience members, I'm taking my prerogative to ask first, but please um, raise your hands or go to the other microphone um, to, to take the next one. So my, my question is about the importance of contract law as a mechanism in enforcement of community guidelines, because I think there's a lot of kind of vagueness about whether what gets called toss removals are actually a product of a terms of service or are a product of discretionary community guidelines that don't have that much to do legally with the terms of service. And I think this matters and, and matter is different in different jurisdictions to questions like um, 
is are the community guidelines part of an enforceable agreement with a user where the user can come compel you to honor what the community guidelines seem to say about what you're going to remove? Or do you, as a platform, need the, the terms of service as a contractual ground to even be able to remove the user's content? Would you have a right under background law to remove the, the content absent that contractual agreement. Um, so <laughs> it's a big, broad question, um, but I, I hope it's something that, that you've thought about and wrestled with and, and, and thought about the international variations. You know, as anybody who's sort of written a toss for Germany knows, you're going to get very different answers and different questions. And so what is a subject of the toss becomes important with national variation. So often these uh, terms of service are written so that they are intended, they're written explicitly to be judged by the, the platform, right? So if the platform decides this isn't, uh, this isn't a violation of community guidelines, even though you've objected, um, you can't, um, if you're enforcing the terms directly, um, it wouldn't seem like you would have that right. When, uh, in one of the cases I mentioned, they did say, this should come down, this violates your, this was a case brought by a third year law student of all things. Um, and, uh, and the court said, no, you cannot use that, that particular provision affirmatively to, to request this. this it's meant to, it, the contractual clause is written defensively to defend these entities from such claims. So I'll leave it at that. Juniper, I don't know if you have specific thoughts on this. I, this is an area I'm going to leave to our legal department. Um, I have not wrestled with that particular issue. So, you know, we, we uh, look at those terms as a basis on which to enforce our community standards. We certainly feel like we have um, a solid ground to do that. You know, how that would be litigated in a court by one of our users is something I need to leave to somebody else with their company. Oh, Juniper, that leaves it to you. <laughs> And Emma. <laughs> and Emma. Um, and Emma. So yeah, the contractual question is interesting. So there's two sides to it. One is from the perspective of the uploader, and is if we were to make an error, as Emma said, with any system, there will be errors. We do have an appeals process for users who believe that their um, content has been removed and doesn't actually violate our policies. But um, you know, is there is there is there a right to have your content on YouTube, for example? Um, and I think we have pretty broad toss provisions to, to protect us there. Um, and then the other question is, uh, if we make a mistake in the other direction, if we have made a promise to the community that there are certain things that we don't allow, that we've established these rules of the road in order to maintain a certain environment on the site, are we obligated um, to remove content once it's brought to our attention? Um, you know, I think that that's probably a, a stretch, um, just in terms of how we've drafted these guidelines and what kinds of representations we've made about them and the expectations we set about the enforcement mechanisms that we use. Um, they're, they are certainly aspirational. They are an, a reflection of kind of the um, the guidelines we've set out for our, our users. And you know, if you take a, a service like YouTube, we actually have an incredibly active community that is invested in, in helping enforce these guidelines because you have many thousands of people around the world who are making their living off of YouTube. And so they want to maintain its vibrancy. They don't want to see it overcome by pornography or overcome by hate speech. They're invested in making sure the platform maintains its um, its community standards, so we get you know over 200,000 user flags a day, and so on. Um, I, you probably know more, Daphne, about whether these arguments have been tried and failed in the courts. Um, but it sounds it seems like a stretch to me. I, I've actually been a fact witness on this question <laughs> <laughs> in a district court in Jerusalem, but I'll tell you that story later. <laughs> and that oh, was going to be my Jerusalem. question. I have a different answer. My question was gonna be like, Daphne, what do you think? Um, but I mean, at least in the US, right, I think like so many intermediary liability questions, it, Section 230 is the best place we have to turn for an answer where hosts are protected from liability for content they do host and from their decisions to take down content. Um, and so I guess if it was a question of kind of st in the US state contract law versus uh, Section 230's you know, protections as federal law, preempting inconsistent state contract law, that plus the way the companies write their terms to say 
we can change these at any time or enforce them at our discretion means there's, in the US, pro very little recourse, I would imagine, for a contract claim for a user against a company. Yeah. Uh, David, go ahead and then raise your hand if you want me to bring you the microphone for the next. Um, I, I have a question. I, I, I guess it's mostly for Peter and Juniper, maybe, and, and Anupam on the left side uh, of, of the stage. I'm a little surprised, I guess, that the, the you, there doesn't seem to be much interest or discussion amongst the larger platform providers of really getting, making these community guidelines come from the community, to have real input from, I understand that you have engaged users, um, et cetera, and you are trying to serve them, um, and I certainly don't question the right of uh, the private company, YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or anybody else to set the terms and say, take it or leave it, and uh, we are going to enforce them. But it does seem to me that you'd be, speaking to Anupam's point, be in a stronger position in court if it comes to that, of being able to say these are not just simply Mark Zuckerberg's personal idiosyncratic views about what is or is not appropriate. They are, in fact, community standards. And, and to have a, 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 a sort of serious attempt, we talked about this at the, on the first panel a little bit, a serious attempt to have input from this gigantic user base that you have, um, the logistics are complicated and will be difficult uh, to be sure, but to really get some serious input into the formation of the policies in the, in the first place from the people within the community as a way of saying uh, these are more legitimate than, than simply imposed upon, upon the user. I'm curious how you would react to that. Sure. I'll respond by um, telling a story. One of my first projects at Google, um, which I joined, I, I, I'm also a, a lawyer by training and started my legal career at the ACLU as a First Amendment lawyer, so just full disclosure on that. Um, I was asked to take a look at Google's hate speech policy and see whether it was functioning as intended and to do a review of um, where, where we should be, how we should articulate this policy, both at a high level externally and in terms of the internal guidelines. And that question got asked, should we reach out to users? Should we poll the community to find out how people define hate speech? Because wouldn't that be a useful data point? Um, but one of the, the problems with that is that the concept of hate speech is really to protect vulnerable minorities from majority viewpoints. And so I'm not sure that majority public view is necessarily the right guidepost for deciding what we want to do on some of these very tricky issues. Um, and then you also think, you know, we talk a lot about users in, in the tech industry, um, but you know, certainly users are not a monolithic, um, a monolithic body. So. Um, you know, talk about race to the bottom, 80% of YouTube's views come from outside the, the US, I think, is the number. Um, and are we going to give every citizen in the world equal sway in determining what the right um, set of standards is for a company that has really set out, as I said at the beginning, to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Um, you know, China and Russia um, and India would, um, would then be setting, setting the norms. So I think it's, it's I, I understand the thought and we kind of, um, what, what we do as, as a proxy for that, I think, is to engage deeply with civil society in the countries where we operate. And so, you know, we work very closely with civil society groups a, a, across a range of issues. Um, on, on the matter of hate speech, while I was developing the policy, there was a, 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 a process led, a cross-industry working group on hate speech that involved many representatives from civil society that the ADL um, kicked off and that ended up in a set of best practices on how to deal with hate speech online. So there is a lot of deep engagement with civil society, but that's, that's really what we use as a proxy for that thought. I think the, the comment is right on target, um, and we regard our community standards as genuinely coming from and reflecting the values of the community uh, that makes up our users. So that's not just lip service for us at all. And in fact, one of the things that Anupam had up on the screen there in his litany of uh, our difficult issues was the blog post from late last week where we talk about listening more on issues of news worthiness uh, and, and present interest. And so that's something that we're absolutely focused on doing and want to do. Um, you know, how to do it is difficult given the nature of our product and the nature of our users. 
part of my background in the legal profession was in the area of business and human rights. And there, you know, many of those incidents come out of, say, extractive industry situations where you have a factory or a refinery that is creating huge problems, and you can go to the community and engage them and get their concerns on board and try to deal with them. That's a totally different ball game for us. So there are, there are practical difficulties there that we have to confront. And then the other thing is, even if we listen to everybody, the voices are all over the map. And on fundamental content policy issues, you see widely varying stances in South Korea versus the Nordics. So at the end of the day, we're still going to have to have a hand in this in coming up with good solutions. And that's what we try to do. Thank you, Daphne. Uh, I will make an observation, but you can put a question mark at the end and interpret it as an answer, and I'd be happy to hear your views on it as well. Uh, I think it was uh, Juniper, uh, if I pronounce your name correctly, who said that you feel we are at a turning point, or you actually as companies are at a turning point, and inflection point, thank you, but at an inflection point. And I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think that I don't mean to be the, the party killer, and I understand that these are difficult issues that you're grappling with and you're doing your best to handle them. But if I have to be honest, I think that this industry, the online services industry, which let's face it is mostly US in terms of big companies, is severely underestimating the mood that is certainly present in Europe. I think it's present in the US as well, if I look at the electoral campaign uh, that we're going through of uh, localism and refusal of those values of uh, international relationship, international order, looking beyond your borders, that we thought at least had characterized for a very long time our, our world. And this means that the amount of goodwill that you have had for a very long time uh, when you made mistakes which happen, when you kind of, uh, I didn't use the terms, but I will quote a colleague who used it, uh, when you applied a little bit of Silicon Valley parochialism in uh, applying your rules. Uh, uh, I think that the time is running very short, and I'm a bit worried because I don't hear a lot of uh, concrete solutions to this that go beyond what each single company is going to do. I don't see this industry moving together as an industry in uh, proposing solutions uh, to problems that are real and are difficult, I, I get it, uh, but that do not in the end only boil down to I as a company A will do this, or a company B or a company C, we as an industry we are going to propose this as a long-term or mid-term solution to governments. You can, there is a question well, mark at the end if you want. I'll just briefly say that one example of exactly that is the hate speech code of conduct that we um, collectively entered into with the European Commission um, this year. Uh, Facebook, Microsoft, Twitter, and, and Google, or Google on behalf of YouTube. Um, and, and this code of conduct basically set out um, some commitments on how we will handle illegal hate speech on our services, um, which included things like timely enforcement of um, legal removal requests and of content policy flags, um, and also to continue our work on counter speech, which um, may not be a, a, a part of the approach that everyone in the room agrees with, but we think is incredibly valuable when it comes to these global communication platforms to show that they actually can be incredible counterweights to forces of hate and division and extremism in the world and that they can counter those, um, those I ideologies very effectively. And so that's the second pillar of, of our strategy and something that all the companies work on together as well. I think just to add to that, what I would point to is that there are important differences amongst the platforms uh, as well in terms of what their products are. Um, and that sometimes leads to differences in policy. The differences may be larger or smaller, but we're, we're not all exactly similarly situated, even though on many issues we communicate and we talk to each other and we try to share best practices. Um, and I just note that the uh, so the code of conduct that Juniper mentions, um, you know, which came out this summer, <laughs> wasn't exactly received across the board as definitely a positive development. Um, many civil society organizations, my organization, CDT, Article 19, um, I think Access and Edry, who had been involved in some discussions around it, um, were were very concerned about the way this kind of this code presented an agreement between governments and companies for expedient takedown of material without kind of reference to what is the 
particular judicial process that will back this up in terms of making determinations that speech is illegal and crucially providing this access to remedy for people whose speech is affected. Um, and so I think that's, uh, it was surprising to see this code come out without, uh, in addition to these firm commitments about what the, the companies will do and how the governments will be sending um, notices or reports, there, there were no specific commitments around transparency or accountability or remedy. And I think those absolute, you know, whatever we're doing, whatever we're, how we're looking at addressing these big difficult issues going forward, those are just as much a part of the conversation as, so how do we take it down? Um, those, if those elements of remedy and accountability are not there, we don't have a solution to a problem because we need, as, as individuals, as you know, members of a democratic society, we need that accountability for these processes. Um, and so I just say that that is something we should be looking for for any of these solutions. So we are running a little bit over time. Um, I'm going to give the last question to Jacob Rogers from Wikimedia, who has been bumped, I think, twice. <laughs> uh, apologies to Mike and Graham for, for not getting to you guys. You got to talk a lot. And we, we will all talk over beverages momentarily. So I hope this is a good last question. But what I want to ask about is uh, those users who may not be able to be present for a lot of these conversations, so people who due to reasons of international law or of different community standards either are not able to participate or may not feel welcome to participate in these communities even though uh, in theory they might want to or ought to be participating. So how do you, um, you know, modify your policies and uh, address finding those people and identifying their needs? Can you tell me a little bit more about what types of communities you're talking about? Are these people in countries that have repressive regimes or people who have been kicked off the platform or what, I'm, I'm, could you help me a little bit? I guess I'm actually thinking both, right? There are people who are in oppressive regimes that might want to participate in communities and can't, but there are also people who are minorities or otherwise don't feel welcome for some reason in a general online community and they, they have different needs. Sure. Um, I guess I would say two things. One is that in our policies on bullying and harassment and hate speech, we definitely try to take account of those types of issues to calibrate our policies so that people will feel welcome and able to engage, um, but without you know, cutting so broadly that legitimate political speech is gonna be taken down. And the other thing is that, you know, frankly, when we are setting our standards for how many strikes will get somebody kicked off the platform, we're also thinking, well, you know, in many instances, we want this person to stay engaged. We do not want them to be gone because then we don't have a chance to exercise counter speech, which is what Juniper was talking about, and, and really the sort of outside of the sphere of the very positive environment that we think we've created on the platform. So that's another area where we try to get the right balance. I, I um wanted to give a, an example that's not really about our content policies, but is more about how we handle legal removals. Um, so I didn't, I didn't get into a lot of detail in my opening remarks about, uh, about legal removals and, and when we push back. Um, there, if you look at our transparency report, I think we average, um, uh, on average, we comply with about 65% of the request to remove content based on an allegation that it violates a particular nation's laws. And sometimes we push back because we need more information, the request was incomplete, um, the request doesn't actually match the underlying law cited, et cetera. But there are also many cases where we push back as a matter of principle. So a recent one that I dealt with was in Kenya where the Kenyan Film Classification Board, which had the authority to enforce um, these, these laws, asked us to uh, remove a video that violated Kenyan law against promotion of homosexuality. Um, and it was a film made in Africa. Um, and we, you know, a lot of these decisions are a bunch of us in a room together debating what to do. And in this case, we refused to comply with that request. And um, one, of the, one of the tools we have in our toolboxes in instances like that is to put a warning interstitial in front of the video, which um, we almost didn't do, um, but we actually modified the wording just to say this has been flagged um, as potentially violating Kenyan law, but we left it up. Um, so we do make a lot of um, hard calls like that uh, that have often led to our services being blocked in particular countries. Um, and are, are really driven by the company's desire to defend the right of 
people to um, express themselves and often are in the defense of political speech, political dissent, or other kinds of content that as a matter of value and principle, we don't want to be complicit in censoring. So I think we are going to wrap it up there. Thank you so much to these panelists and to every panelist. Thank you so much to the audience. We've had an incredibly smart and engaged audience today. And I think there are a lot of people here who are actors in this space. You're in government, you are at a tech platform, you're at an NGO, you're a, you know, a speaker in the conversation about these things. And, and so our hope really with this conference is that things that were discussed today can be useful to you in deciding what you want to do, how you want to do it, what resources you can draw on, what arguments there are, what potential allies there are among the people that you've met here at the conference. Um, and so I really hope that you all take that away with you and begin those conversations over drinks, which are being served right out there. Thanks a lot. To you.